I want to take a moment with you and uh, have you turn with me. Uh, let's, uh, you can begin with Genesis chapter three. I'm going to be jumping around, so I don't expect you to open the scripture to every passage that I'm going to be looking at with you. But as we begin this morning, I want to remind you, when Jesus' disciples asked him to teach them how to pray, he said, when you pray, pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. You know why he taught them to pray that prayer? simply because God desires to rule over all that he has created. And human beings are God's creation, and he created them to be especially the earthly family and the imagers of himself on this earth. Human beings are God's representatives on this planet. And we have the responsibility to actually share his rule on earth. In fact, that garden called Eden, that was God's earthly home that he would dwell in with humanity, with his human family here on earth. And Eden really is the idea where the kingdom of God began. And the original task that God gave to human beings was that they would make the whole earth like Eden. By the way, when you finish the story in Revelation 21 and 22, that is an actual reality. That this whole earth will be like the Garden of Eden one day. God will see to it. But something happened in that beautiful garden. Enter the Satan. We call him Satan. I don't think it's really a name as much as it is a function. It's a role that he plays. Because Satan means accuser. And he is the accuser. He accuses Israel. He accuses humanity to God. And I want to look at him a moment as we begin, as he enters that garden. Heavenly Father, as we pause a moment to pray, we just thank you for what we've already heard. We thank you for the music and the songs that prepared our heart. But now, Lord, with our hearts open, would you plant within them the good seed of your word, and may these hearts be like that good ground that would bring forth much fruit for your glory. We thank you that you give understanding, Spirit of God, we're depending upon your anointing, because you are the unction from the Holy One. And so give unction, give anointing, both to my lips and to the ears of any hearer, we pray that you would accomplish precisely what you will for your glory and for Jesus's uh, glory. We ask it in, in his name. Amen. The accuser enters that garden paradise. You know who he is? He is an angelic being. Uh, he is a member. Satan is a member of God's heavenly family. He had a heavenly family before he created an earthly family. He's a member of God's heavenly family, and I'm telling you, he was not happy. He was not pleased with God's decision to create a human family and give them dominion over this earth. And so as a result, he appears in Genesis 3, in the form of a serpent. Don't think of a snake. Uh, this was a supernatural being that uh, appeared to Eve in that garden. And in doing so, he very seductively seduced her to sin. And that required, he knew, that God would have to 
eliminate his rival that he was jealous over, that God would have to eliminate the human, that that would mean death of the human family. And if they died, there'd be no descendants. And so there'd be no human imagers. And so there'd be no kingdom. And that would be good in his book. But I had you turn to Genesis chapter 3, where it all happened. Where you first see Satan on the scene. Because God answers that. None of this took God by surprise. Because Jesus has been declared the Lamb of God that was slain from the foundation of the world. All of this was pre-planned by our Lord. And in the 15th verse of chapter uh, 3, the Lord says to Satan, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed or your descendants and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, that is, the seed of the woman, will bruise your head, Satan, and you will bruise her seed's heel. That's Genesis 3.15. So enter Satan, but then enter that one that is called the seed. The fall in the garden. It separated God from humanity. By the way, that's what death is. Death is a separation. When a person, a human being, dies physically, their, their physical body is separated from the immaterial part of their person. Their spirit and soul is separated from their body. Death is a separation. And so when sin entered humanity, it separated them from God. But what this verse tells us, Genesis 3.15, is that God would make a way of deliverance to bring back his people into his family. And I think it's deliberately cryptic in that verse because it's a reference to Jesus the Messiah. And uh, he has kept it in cryptic terms. There would be a future descendant of Eve who would undo all the damage that was done by Satan. He would restore the human family. That restoration would require a special childbirth. And I think that's probably the only way to viably explain a verse like 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, in the context of, of the women ministering in the church, he, he, he says that that should not happen, that a woman would usurp the authority in a local church because Eve was deceived and was in the transgression. But then in, the, in that final verse 15, it says, but she, woman, shall be saved through childbearing. And it's referring, I believe, to the promise of Genesis 3.15, that the woman would be the one that would bring forth this seed, the Messiah himself. Now, if you'll go from Genesis 3 for a moment to Genesis chapter 11, because here's another big step in God's dealing with the human family. In Genesis chapter 11, we have the story or the account of what we would call the Tower of Babel. Now, Babel and Babylon are the same. And so Babylon is at the heart of the Old Testament worldview. It was at Babel in Genesis 11 that people sought power by building this ziggurat, this uh, this religious uh, uh, temple in which to reach toward the unseen realm of the gods. You can read about it with me. It says that uh, in verse 3, they said, let us make brick. 
and stone and slime for, uh, for mortar. Let us, verse 4, build us a city, a tower, whose top may reach unto the heaven. Let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. God went down, verse 7, and he confounded their language that they wouldn't understand one another's speech. Verse 8 of this chapter, the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. I don't know if you realize this, but the explanation of what was actually happening in Genesis chapter 11 at the Tower of Babel is actually explained for us. We have the explanation of that in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 8. And here's what the verse says. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the, the our version says, the children of Israel. But most manuscripts uh, say that it is the, the, the sons of God or the children of God, meaning his heavenly family, or these lesser gods, you might say, the heavenly hosts. And so what this tells us is that at Babel, God judged the nations of this earth. And prior to chapter 11, there is a table of nations in chapter 10, 70 nations, that God judged the nations by dispersing them, by divorcing himself from them by disinheriting the nations and placing them under the authority of those who are called the sons of God, these dark gods that had co uh, conspired with Satan. And it's as if God is saying to them, okay, if you don't want a relationship with me, then I'll give you a lesser God. And in Psalm 82, he reveals his judgment upon these lesser gods because of their corrupt administration of the nations. In Psalm 82, it says, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. And he tells them, you'll die like men. You'll die like mere mortals. And so Psalm 82 reveals that God judged these gods of darkness for their corrupt administration of the nations of the world. But I want you to listen to verse 9 of Deuteronomy 32. He turns the nation, disinherits the nations, and turns them over to these dark gods of the unseen realm. But he says in verse 9, but the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. So the nations he turns over to these lesser gods, but he says, Israel is my portion. Israel is my inheritance. And so he separates himself from the nations, but he selects he selects a nation, and he selects that nation before it even existed. And he does so through a particular man. And you know, uh, Genesis chapter 12, let me read this. The Lord said to Abram, get thee out of thy country from the kindred, your kindred, your father's house unto a land I'll show you, and I'll make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, curse him that curseth thee, and in thee, Abram, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God makes a, se a selection. What he's saying is, I'm going to begin anew. <laughs> I'm going to enter into a covenant relationship with a nation that I will create by calling Abram right out of the middle of the rebels 
to build a nation from him. And so Israel was chosen by God, even before it existed, to serve as a conduit for the nations that were in spiritual bondage to these corrupt sons of God to return to the true God. And really from the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11 onward, the whole Bible story is Israel versus the disinherited nations. God versus the corrupt, rebellious sons of God. And it sets up a great a cosmic geological holy war, or jihad, if I can say it that way. And that's what Haman and Purim is about. And that's what Hamas and Israel is about. But enter now the Savior. In Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, we are, we are told this, that in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son to be born of a woman, made under the law, that he might redeem them that are under the law. But let me tell you, these gods of darkness are not going to surrender without a fight. And at the center of that fight is the Messiah. He is the seed of Abraham. We know that specifically from Galatians 3.16. When he said the, uh, the seed, he didn't say seeds, plural. He said seed, singular, and he meant the Messiah. And these gods of darkness, they were aware of who Jesus is, but they were ignorant of God's full plan of redemption through Jesus. They had not figured it out. They did not connect the dots. In fact, we're told that in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 6, that if these dark gods would have understood that through the crucifixion, they would bring about their own defeat, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. He pulled the wool over their eyes. They thought if they could kill the Jewish Messiah, they'd be done with him. But little did they know, his death was actually the catalyst through which he would reclaim all the disinherited nations of this earth and one day restore Eden to this whole earth. In fact, in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 17, uh, and 70, those two chapters, you have a turning point in the ministry of Jesus in his earthly ministry. In Matthew chapter 16, he takes his disciples up to a, a place called Caesarea Philippi. And Caesarea Philippi was located in an area of Israel known as Bashan. It, in ancient Near Eastern uh, thought, that area of Caesarea Philippi was the center of pagan idolatry for all the nations. It was, it was located at the foot of Mount Hermon. And there is controversy, of course, uh, regarding what Jesus meant when he said uh, to Peter, you're the stone. <laughs> But upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. I believe that what he was saying, because of that geographical location, that the rock was Mount Hermon. And I believe that because in Jewish tradition, Mount Hermon is the mountain of the gods. It was the place where these rebellious, dark sons of God rebelled against God. And they have discovered archaeologically that there are at least 20 pagan temples in that area. Right there at the foot of Mount Hermon in Caesarea Philippi, there is a natural uh, spring of water that uh, gushes out of a cave. And the ancients called that the entrance to the underworld or the gates of hell. And Jesus at Caesarea Philippi, at the foot of the mountain of the gods, uh, at the gates of hell, said, 
I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail, will not be able to sustain against its attack. In other words, the church is on the move. The Lord's church is on the move and the gates of hell as a result are under assault and they will be incapable of withstanding the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 17, that's 16, in chapter 17 of Matthew, Jesus takes three of his disciples, his inner circle, up on Mount Hermon, and there he is transfigured before them. And I believe what he's doing is he's putting the, these, these gods of darkness on notice that he is here to reclaim the nations. And that the kingdom of God is at hand. That's the claim. But when you go to the cross, you come to the conquest. The cross is where he conquered. People look at him hanging there in weakness and they think it's over. But it actually is his conquering, his conquest. I don't have the time to do it. But there is a real parallel between the crucifixion account in Matthew 27 and the prophecy of the crucifixion in Psalm 22. For example, Psalm 22 predicts that uh, they would cast lots for his garments. That actually happens in the account in Matthew 27. Another thing, the 22nd Psalm begins with the words that Jesus uttered on that cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So there's a real parallel between Matthew 27 and Psalm uh, 22. In Psalm 22 and verse 12, a psalm of the cross, the psalmist says that he is surrounded or encompassed by or encircled by the bulls, listen to me, of Bashan. The bulls of Bashan at the cross. Let me remind you of something. In 1 Kings chapter 12, a wicked man by the name of Jeroboam, he usurped 10 of the kingdoms of Israel, the northern kingdom, and he formed a wicked idolatrous system. He actually cast two idols that were in, in the form of bulls, golden bulls. And he set up one of those golden bulls to be worshipped in idolatry by the nation of Israel in Bashan, in the city of Dan, up in that territory. Now, that made that territory for Israel an, idolat an idolatrous center. He put together a priesthood. He set up uh, uh, Jewish holidays that would uh, mimic the real holidays that Israel, or, or feasts that Israel was supposed to observe. In the ancient Near East, the people thought of Bashan as the place of the snake. That's what they called it because Bashan was associated with demonic powers. So I hope you understand what's going on here. It, you, you might say that Bashan, the city of Dan, Bashan, Caesarea Philippi, Mount Hermon is really ground zero for Old Testament demonic geography. At the cross, we are told in Psalm 68 that Jesus conquered Bashan. And Paul picks up on that in Ephesians chapter 4. But let me just share with you a little bit from uh, Psalm 68. Listen to this. In the, the 15th verse, we read, The hill of God is as the hill of Bashan. Well, the hill of God is Mount Zion in Jerusalem. The hill of God is as the hill of Bashan, and high hill as the hill of Bashan. 
He says that verse 17, the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them as in Sinai, in the holy place. Thou hast ascended on high. This is uh, Psalm 68, 18. Thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts for men. Yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. It says in verse uh, 22, the Lord said, I will bring again from Bashan. I will bring my people again from the depths of the sea. You know what's going on here? Bashan, remember Mount Hermon, the mountain of the gods? He, he is, he's comparing Mount Hermon, the mountain of gods there in Bashan, with Sinai in verse 17. And there is hostility that is pictured in this psalm. There is jealousy that is going on uh, between uh, uh, of Hermon against Mount Zion. Why? Because God chose Mount Zion in Jerusalem as his dwelling place. And so there's a contrast here between Sinai, which is said to be holy ground in that uh, 15th or 17th verse, and, uh, and Bashan, which is unholy ground. And what this psalm tells us is that one day, God demolished the strongholds of Bashan. And verse 18, he led captivity captive, which is a picture of victorious army general that leads the enemy that he conquered captive behind him and takes the spoils of war, and he gifts the people, his own people, with the spoils of war. Now, with that in mind, let me jump over to Ephesians chapter 4 and listen to this. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, this is Christ, he led captivity captive, he gave gifts unto men, he ascended that he might also descend into the lower parts of the earth. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, evangelists, some pastors and teachers. The picture here is that Jesus, the Messiah, is identified as the one that leads captivity captive. As, the, as God that is surrounded by the bulls of Bashan at the cross. Now these gods of darkness are all against Jesus, but at the cross, he put them to open shame, remember? In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15, it says that he spoiled these principalities and powers. It means he stripped them of all of their goods. He stripped them of all of their powers. He stripped them of all of their ability. And he made a show of them openly. He paraded them as captives behind him, is the picture. And so at the cross, Jesus put these gods of darkness to open shame. He conquered them by his death on the cross. And in that ancient Near Eastern mindset, the conqueror then would parade these captives and he would demand tribute for himself. And Jesus conquered the enemy and he distributed the benefits, the spoils, through his Holy Spirit to his church. That's what verse 9 and verse 11 are telling us. Through his sacrifice on the cross, he demolished the gods of Bashan, the gods of darkness, and he triggered the empowering, the empowerment of the church by the gifts the Holy Spirit distributed beginning at Pentecost. And in doing so, you know what happened at Pentecost. He reversed Babylon. Instead of the confounding of tongues, there was an understanding given to tongues. And uh, instead of scattering the nations, the nations are regathered beginning at Pentecost. In fact, that's what the book of Acts is all about. It's about the regathering, the reclaiming, and the regathering of the nations of this earth through the gospel message of the apostles. And that's why you have all of these different uh, letters to churches in, in the New Testament. It's, it's the nations. It's letters to the nations. It's the reclaiming that has uh, begun. 
and it's not over yet. It's still happening, and God is still claiming the nations, and he hasn't forgotten Israel, and one day he's going to restore them too, and he's going to reunite this human family for eternity on this earth in the new Jerusalem. It's amazing. This is this is this is what Palm Sunday really is the forerunner of. It Palm Sunday is to remember his entrance into Jerusalem, where he was the mock king, you might say, so that he could get to the cross, pulling the wool over the eyes of the sons of God, so that he could defeat them once and for all. And they're defeated. And they're destroyed. And de destruction, the, the word used for destruction doesn't mean that they're annihilated. It means that they are under his authority and one day they will be annihilated in a place called the Lake of Fire. This is a marvelous plan. This is what God has been doing. And I hope that if you don't know him as your savior, you get right with him today. You receive him as your savior because you're on the losing side until you get on God's side. And you don't have a hope. You have no chance apart from trusting Jesus as your own personal savior. So if you've been putting it off, if you've been trying to play games with God, the jig's up. You're a loser until you receive Jesus as your savior. You can't play with the almighty. You can't win. Don't think that you're wise. Don't think that you know better than what God says in his word. Today is the day of salvation. You may never have another chance. So if you need to receive him, today's the day. If you need to get right with him, today's the day. And if you are a believer, this kind of stuff should thrill your heart. Because you are on the winning side. <laughs> And, and really, as much as the current events upset us, when you recognize it's okay, God has this under his sovereign control. And let the heathen rage, as Psalm 2 says. Let them rage. He that sits in the heaven laughs. He holds them in derision. I hate to say it this way, but God's going to have the last laugh. And it's not a laughing matter. But people that hold up their fists in defiance against God are one day going to be among those, sadly, in Philippians chapter 2, that have to bow their knee and have their, their cursing tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If you are a believer, what a blessing. What a joy. What encouragement. Doesn't that motivate you to want to live for him? Doesn't that motivate you to want to be the witness? Doesn't that motivate you to say, you know what? It doesn't matter. If this, this is what God's doing, I want to be 100%. I want to be all in with what God's doing. Then why don't you make this day, if you are a believer, why don't you make this a day of real dedication, if rededication, whatever, and consecration to God, that whatever time you have left, and you don't know how much time you have left, none of us do, it's, you're going to be all in for God. You're going to be on the winning side. 